caught me participating. I wasn't ready for them to be over. Lord, we bless you. We just are grateful for your goodness and for your mercy, your presence in this place this morning. And we ask that you would just rest on each one here, that we would experience all that you have this morning. We welcome you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I forgot there was a change in plan this morning. Y'all need to remind me of that before we get up. Uh, I remember I was told this like on Friday. I forgot all about that. I've slept since then. Well, good morning. Good to see you all here. I'm glad you're here. And We're just... Uh, Somebody's trying to give me what? Don't 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 wave at me if you don't have something cuz that's uh that's distracting. Everybody wave at me. All right, what do you want? Ah, ah. That's the way that isn't that the way it works? All right. No, I'm listen. It's a good it's a good day. It's a good morning. And it is so good to be in in the the church building with you. Uh you know, I was talking, Marie and I were out of town last week. We went to Houston. Surprisingly enough, we visited the same church as the pastor who spoke the week before. Now, that wasn't intended. We didn't know that at the point we left, and it just turned out to be kind of that kind of a situation. It was really neat. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that he and Carlos said to us when they were here, or when we met them, how moving it was to them to be able to be in the building in fellowship with other believers because in Houston they are still under a very strict lockdown and have a very limited number of people who can even come in the sanctuary and uh, that freedom they were moved by. And I'm moved by it too. Now, I th I last week I had made the announcement or I sent out the email that said, uh, you know, we're requesting masks when you're in the public setting or ministering because it's just that's what our uh, civil government has asked us to do. And so we're doing it. Now, I'll tell you the truth. I hate these things. All right? I, I'm not lying. I, I don't like them. But I understand. And it's not persecution to have to wear one. It's inconvenience. All right? So we'll try to be considerate of each other. That's not mandatory, it's a request and a recommendation. 
but it is, uh, it's a way that we can honor each other. So, uh, listen, uh, I read a meme on Facebook a couple of weeks ago that really struck me. It says, it's funny that in the church we'd have problems with that because generally we've worn masks in public most of our lives. So, uh, we ought to be used to it. No, we're, listen, it's just a, it's just a, 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 a way that we can just honor those who are, uh, you know, who, who are struggling right now. And, and listen, all of us are struggling in some regard. All of us are. It is a challenging time. And I just want to just uh, to commend you on, one, your faithfulness through this time, your faithfulness in, in continuing on mission, your faithfulness to the church, your faithfulness in giving, your faithful, faithfulness on being even in fellowship. And as fellowship, one of the things that's come out of all of this, I'm going to preach, just pardon me for a minute. One of the things that has uh, come out of all of this, I think, at least in my life and what I've witnessed, is our appreciation for relationships. Because when suddenly they are withdrawn and we find ourselves having to really work to maintain them, somehow they've gotten more valuable to me. And so, you know, when I, I was with a bunch of pastors and they tend to want to ask you questions like, what is it out of all of this that we're going through that you want to keep and maintain even after all this stuff's over? And almost all of them say that sense of the value of being able to gather, the sense of the value of being able to get together, to worship together, to do life together, that I don't want it to go backwards. I don't want to lose that sense of uh, importance of that because I think we can take it for granted. And if anything has come out of all of this stuff that we've gone through in the last year, it's the sense that we, it, it, those things we took for granted, toilet paper, you know, things that we took for granted, we can now look at and go, man, I just never knew what life might be like if these things were withdrawn. Going out to eat is actually a privilege. And I just, uh, I just think that the Lord has given us an opportunity to just re-up on some things and re-understand some of the privileges that he's granted us. So I say all that to just say, I love you guys, and I love being able to gather with you. And so uh, bless you. A couple of things I want to announce. We've got Sockham cutoff. So if you're going to do Sockham this year, you've got, what, another two weeks to get your apps in and your startup money in. And if you haven't done Sockham, the School of Kingdom Ministry, that's our, our School of Supernatural here, I encourage you to do it if you've not done it. And if you uh, would like to participate in that, uh, grab Anel Bowman, and she's back on the back waving her hand. Everybody turn around and look at Anel. Okay, yeah, wasn't that fun? All right, so uh, if you, uh, if you want to do that, then grab her. Uh, that starts in January. So the school starts in January, but the cutoff to sign up is in a couple of weeks. Also, we still have the sock drive going on. There's a box out in the lobby for you to drop off new socks. These are going to We Will Go Ministries downtown Jackson. That is a really neat work and just the simple way we can participate. And then uh, i just tell you, it's already here, believe it or not. Next week, we begin the Advent season leading up to Christmas. Can you believe it? Christmas music already on. Ah. Christmas music is already on. It was on, be it was on before uh, October, actually, in some places. So anyway, it's here. Christmas season's upon us. We're going to begin officially in the church with the Advent season next Sunday and begin a series. We've got a new series we're going to call the, uh, the, the Risk of Christmas. It's going to just be five weeks as we go toward Christmas on, on different aspects of the risk that was taken by those in the Christmas story and narrative. And I'm looking forward to this. It's going to be a fun series. And then we still have uh, our Wednesday night things. Those of you who are still jumping on on Wednesday night, I still enjoy getting with you 
and presenting some teachings on Wednesday night on Facebook. So if you would join us on that, we'd appreciate it. So we're going to receive our offering. If you could put the slide up, gentlemen, we have uh, several ways to give right now. And again, I want to commend your faithfulness. If you're online, you can, uh, if you're watching online, you can give through the uh, online site at the vineyardjackson.org slash giving, or you can jump in and do a text giving. The text number is 601-368-8168. Just type that number, text that number with an amount, and it will lead you through what else you need to do. And I just, uh, again, we appreciate your faithfulness. Let me pray as you whip out your phones to do the offering now. I always wanted to do that. Just stop and go like, all right, everybody pull out your phone. And uh, all right, flip it open. We're ready. Flip it open. That tells you how old I am. What's new, what's old comes back new again, right? So Lord, we thank you. I thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you are with us and that you are walking with us through even the most challenging times that you are walking with us. And Lord, we just pray. I pray right now. I was just thinking this morning, talking this morning about our brothers and sisters who truly are in parts of the world where they have no freedom to worship, where they are under so many things that are truly persecution. And we pray right now for our brothers and sisters around the world that this morning, that, that today, your presence would be upon them and that your, your glory would shine upon them. And that they would experience you and experience uh, freedom in their spirit. And Lord, we ask for freedom in their bodies and in their situations where they are, where they are living. Lord, would you bring freedom into their situations? And Lord, would you make us examples of your goodness and your mercy and your glory in the place that you've put us? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this morning we have a treat in Miss Carla Hall, pastor. Would you come? This is like having Thanksgiving every day. I know, but better because it's not Thanksgiving. The hotel wasn't nice to your father. We're staying here. When's dinner going to be ready? Okay, yeah. I think you'd have a better chance catching the football if you put the phone down! Yeah. Five second rule. Ah! Yeah, this, this is, is much better. better. Slow roasted and carved thick. thick. Oscar Mayer Carving Board gives you all the taste of the holidays without all the hassle. It's holiday. So it's Thanksgiving week. You might, you might or might not be excited about that. For me, For me it's, it's a yes because, because I'm a teacher and my school is closed all week. So thankful I am. am. Yes, yes, I know, I know right? right? And, and honestly, honestly, it's easy right, right now, now for, for me to be thankful because despite all the widespread challenges that we're all facing, it's been a pretty peaceful time lately for Richard and me personally. Like our kids, our jobs, our relationships, everything's going pretty smoothly right now, at least no high-level drama. So um, I always want to be careful, though that when I stand up here and open my mouth, that I do not project my own feelings, my own situations onto you. Because the truth is, life is seasonal. There's spring, and there's summer, and then there's winter. And there's been a lot of winter lately. We're all in different seasons. So for some of you, the traditions of Thanksgiving bring you kind of a sense of comfort and sense of stability that you really need right now. You know, the big feast and like the football, even the shopping for Pete's sake, although there's probably something wrong with you if that's the case. But, but those things can bring sort of a sense of normalcy that you might need right now, right? But then for some of you, like you dread all that holiday stuff, right? <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's expensive, and then there's like all of our weird families and the awkward tension that seems to show up when everybody gets together. But on the other hand, some of you would love to be with family because some of you are not going to get that opportunity this year. Or maybe you've lost somebody in your family, 
And Thanksgiving without them is going to be painful. My father died this year. And so holidays in my family are never going to quite be the same. You know, some people are saying that the only thing to be thankful for is that 2020 is coming to an end. Yeah. I mean, enough is enough, enough, right? right? It's been been a a heavy heavy year. year. So, how do you approach this week, Thanksgiving Thanksgiving week? week. If If you you know you should should be thankful, but you're really just not feeling it. Or maybe you're like me, I'm thankful that everything's going well right now, but I always have this sense that it's not going to last. Like it might be spring in my life right now, but winter's coming. You know, something's going to happen to burst the bubble. Do you know that person who on Thanksgiving Day says, all right, by golly, turn off the TV. Everybody gather around. Nobody is going to eat a bite of anything until we all go around and everybody says what they're thankful for. They're trying to bring some kind of meaning back into Thanksgiving. So that is a great tradition. And we'll say things like, well, I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my job, for my health, for passing that class. And all those things are, they're valid. They're also all fragile. I have a a friend who has lost like four jobs in the last year. You know, just when she thinks she can finally breathe, everything falls apart again. That's been a reminder to me that everything I think I have could be gone in a heartbeat. One diagnosis. You know, one, one turn of a steering wheel. One decision made in a split second. All the things that we tend to say make us feel thankful could be gone just like that. Maybe, maybe we need a different kind of thanksgiving, especially this year. You know, a kind of thanksgiving, a kind of thankfulness that doesn't depend on whether life is in an upswing right now. It doesn't even require good feelings. What if there's a kind of thankfulness that doesn't come and go with our feelings, but it stays right here and keeps on giving us hope, even when it feels like the dead of winter? I think, I think I found the secret to that kind of thanksgiving in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Now, it's not a traditional Thanksgiving scripture, and on the surface, it doesn't actually even appear to be about Thanksgiving. But surprise, I found out that's actually really what it's all about, a reason to be thankful that is so much more powerful because it doesn't depend on whether things are going well. It doesn't depend on our feelings. So just to prove to you that it's a Thanksgiving scripture, I'm going to read to you verse 28 of that chapter. Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let let us be thankful. thankful. There There it is. is. Let Let us us be thankful. thankful. And And so so worship worship God God acceptably with with reverence reverence and and awe. Do you you notice notice that that the very first first word of that that verse is therefore? therefore. Which Which means means that if you're going to understand anything, you can't read just that verse in isolation. You've got to stop, back it up, and go find out what it's there for. Yeah. So if we back up from that verse that tells us to be thankful, we see that earlier in that chapter, the writer is actually painting this picture, a picture of two mountains. Now, the first mountain is Mount Sinai. Who remembers what happened on Mount Sinai? Okay, Moses received the Ten Commandments from God on Mount Sinai. The other mountain was Mount Zion, which actually, like geographically, is just a hill in Jerusalem, But 
Symbolically, it represents God's house, his presence, where he dwells. So before we read this painting of the two mountains, we've got to remember about Hebrews. Hebrews was a letter. It was written to Jewish people who had become followers of Jesus. So they believed the message about Jesus, but they were still immersed in this Jewish culture, the Jewish system, the Jewish law. So the writer of the letter is trying to help them understand, hey, this might be a big change for you, but do not let yourself slide back into being slaves to the Jewish law because that's exactly what Jesus came to set you free from. In fact, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, the book of Hebrews is um, it's known as the book of better things. The book of better things because it's about how Jesus came to bring something that was so much better than that old system of the law. So with that in mind, we're going back to the painting of the two mountains. Hebrews 12, 18. So the writer of the letter is saying to these Jewish believers, you've not, not come, come to, to a, a mountain, mountain that, that can be touched and, and that is burning, burning with fire, fire to, to darkness, darkness and gloom and storm, storm to, a to a trumpet, trumpet blast or to such, such a voice speaking words that, that those who heard it begged that, that no further word be spoken to them because they, they could not bear, bear what was commanded, commanded that, that if even an animal touches the mountain, mountain it must be stoned. The, the sight, sight was so terrifying that, that even, even Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. This scene is straight out of a horror movie. Did you, Did you find in the book of Exodus, of Exodus where God said to Moses, hey, I want to talk to the people. people. So, so have, have them come at the stand at the foot of the mountain, mountain and, I'll and I'll talk to them from the mountain. mountain. But, but don't, don't let them get, get too close because you step, you step over, over the line, you die. So Moses leads the people out and they inch their way up toward the mountain and they're standing there waiting. And that's, and that's when, when it starts, starts to rain. It starts, starts to rain and it gets harder and, and harder and harder. And, and, harder. Pretty and pretty soon the whole mountain, mountain is just being pounded with, with this torrential downpour. downpour. Claps of thunder everywhere. Lightning striking all over. And then, go figure, the whole mountain erupts into flames like a volcano. And this huge, huge, thick cloud of billowing smoke just engulfs everything. It's like they, they can hardly even see. So while they're trying to get their bearings then, the ground starts to shake like an earthquake. And they can hardly stand up. And then there's this noise. This noise like, like a little kid trying to learn to play the trumpet. Have you ever heard that noise? And it gets louder and louder and louder. And finally the people can't stand it and they say, Moses, go, just go. Go and talk to that monster God and find out what he wants. But do not let him say a word to us. That was Mount Sinai. Mount Nightmare. Because it's exactly the stuff that nightmares are made of. God was terrifying. And the, and the people's relationship with God was all about trying to avoid the harsh punishment that they had actually earned through their disobedience. So, I'm not getting any warm Thanksgiving vibes so far, are you? And when we're trying to feel thankful, we really prefer not to think of God as terrifying. But here's what we've got to understand, though, is that the mountain that's on this side of the painting was a view of what happened when the people's imperfection and, and disobedience crashed up against God's absolute perfection and purity under that old system of the law. See, the system was the law. God was law enforcement. Law enforcement doesn't look scary at all as long as you're not breaking any laws. But pass a law enforcement officer going 85 miles an hour down Farm Road 22, your heart's going to skip a beat. In fact, 
just the sight of that officer is going to fill you with dread. That is where God's people of the Old Testament lived. Mount Nightmare. Here's what might be the curveball. God hated that system. What? He never wanted his kids to suffer all this harsh punishment and be terrified of him. You parents understand. When your kid keeps making bad choices, what kills you, what kills you is that it's going to cause him so much pain. And you hate being the one doling out the consequences because then he views you as the terrible tyrant who just doesn't love me. When in reality, you love that kid more than you ever thought you could love anybody. So God, the Father, said, you know what? It's time to move my kids off of Mount Nightmare. Now, the law was the law. And the requirements of the law had to be met. But being the dad that he is, he said, I will gladly take all of the punishment so that my kids can live in a better place. And even though it cost him everything, cost him everything, as he became a human, came to earth, suffered, and died the worst death, but he found a way. He found a way. He found a way to take care of all the law's requirements once and for all so that his kids would never again have to live a life of fear. Instead, they could just enjoy being with him. He moved his kids off Mount Nightmare into a new home. Verse 22. So he says, you haven't come to this horrible, scary mountain, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. Now, so Mount Zion here represents Jerusalem itself. It was the center of Jewish life. It was the place where the temple was, where God's presence and glory was. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels, in joyful assembly. Don't let the word assembly throw you there. This kind of assembly, it's not the kind of assembly that you had to go to in middle school when the drug prevention people came. The word for assembly here means a, like a big party, a feast, an all-out celebration. That's what's going on on Mount Zion. 23. You've come to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. The church or the gathering of the firstborn. You know, in the Bible, the firstborn child received this insane amount of privileges. Like for one thing, he, and it was at, at, in that culture it was a he, he received like twice the inheritance of all the other kids. The oldest kid got twice as much. How does that hit you, Ella? Cope. Owen. Izzy. Yeah, I'm a middle child too. You know, at that time, parents would, parents would unashamedly admit that the firstborn was much more special than all the other kids. Believers, believers in Christ, are all firstborns. We're not only God's children, we're his most honored and privileged children. And you know what? I guarantee you we have an enemy who has worked really hard to keep us from understanding what that means. You, know what, you want to hear something crazy? Jesus is the firstborn of firstborns. And according to the scripture, that means you're completely united with him and you are a co-heir with him of his inheritance from the Father. 
So everything God has given to him, he shares with you. It means you have access to everything he has. His power, his authority, his peace, his wisdom. You know what else? You took on his perfection. So when the Father looks at you, he sees sinlessness. He sees purity. He sees that you are totally and completely forgiven, not just for now, but for the rest of your life. But here's the real kicker. He sees you as completely trustworthy. Completely trustworthy to represent and distribute his kingdom. He trusts you. <laughs> Me? Yeah, you. You know, you might be thinking, well, you don't know me. You don't know that I haven't lived that kind of life that would be trust that God would consider trustworthy. Can I tell you something? How you have lived does not determine who you are. It's the other way around. And the, the more that you begin to understand and believe the truth about who you are in Him, the more that your actions, your lifestyle, will look like it. You are His honored and privileged child. So let's put the two sides of the painting together. What's the writer saying? He's saying, people, do you not realize that your father has rescued you from Mount Nightmare and given you a home on Mount Dream Come True. Mount Dream Come True. In fact, he's moved you into his own house there, a home where there's no fear of punishment because punishment is long gone. No fear of the future, so you can just enjoy being with him. He's given you a home where you are completely accepted, completely valued, completely loved, completely trusted. If you belong to Jesus, that is where you live. Now, whether or not you feel like it at the moment changes nothing. See, we have been trained to rely on our feelings and our senses as indicators of what is the truth. And I am not in any way minimizing the pain of living in this world, but what the Lord has been saying to me is, honey, you got you to gotta learn to start looking beyond what your natural eyes are seeing, looking beyond what your fickle feelings are telling you to see the spiritual reality. Because that spiritual reality is so much more real. Your father's rescued you from Mount Nightmare and given you a home on Mount Dream Come True. That is the reality. Is that, uh, is that not enough to be thankful? Is that not enough to be thankful? In 2008, 12 years ago, it had been winter for about five years in my life. I had lost pretty much everything. I was living in a little apartment that I thought I was never going to be able to get out of because my dogs had destroyed the, the, the carpet, the floors, the baseboards, the door. They literally ate everything. So the apartment manager had made it clear that I would be responsible for all damages when I moved. So I, I, I thought I'll never be able to get out of here, even though I was praying to be able to move to a, a better place. One day, very much unexpectedly, a tornado hit that area, took the roof off of my apartment building completely. Now, I was on the third floor on the top level, and it poured down rain all night, poured down rain. Well, about 3 o'clock in the morning, the ceiling in my apartment, with no roof over it, could no longer stand up under all that rain, and it, and it just started collapsing, just falling to the floor and flooding my apartment. 
I grabbed up my two kids and my two dogs, and we spent the rest of the night in the car driving around looking for phone service, and there was none to be found because that was in the earlier days of uh, cell phones. The next day, I was finally able to get a hold of the apartment management, and they said, well, we've got a, a, another apartment unit we're going to let you move into temporarily, but you've got to be out of this one within two days because we've got to get this building. Two days. I had no family in this area. I didn't know anybody with a truck. I barely had any friends. I didn't have any money to hire somebody to help. But I'd been attending services at Vineyard. So on that Saturday afternoon, I called the Wimberleys, who were the senior pastors at the time, and I got Elaine on the phone. I said, Elaine, I, I, I don't know what to do. I said, do you happen to know anybody with a truck who would be willing to help me? And sweet Elaine, she, she said, well, I don't know, but let me see what I can do. The next morning during the worship service, Jim Hitt walked up here and he took the microphone and he explained what had happened. He said, I'm going to help Carla move this afternoon. And if anybody wants to help, you can meet me there at 2 o'clock. So after the service, my sons and I, we rushed home and started trying to go through the, the mountains of soaking wet debris, trying to save as much as we could and get things ready to move. <clears throat> By 1.30, there were 20-something people on my doorstep. Within two hours, they had me move to the other unit. That day, I was rescued in so many ways. The owners of the apartment complex, the company that owned the apartment complex, ended up paying me to move out of that apartment. And we were able to move to a place that my children absolutely loved. We still have so many precious memories of our time there. But there was so much more than that. See, the enemy thought he was slick. He thought, because I was already so broken, he thought he would just... Push me over the edge. That's right. Finish the job. Push me over the edge by causing me to lose everything else that I had. What he didn't count on was Vineyard Church becoming Jesus to me. I looked around and I realized that everything I had lost was temporary. And everything that really mattered, I had. I realized I had a family who actually accepted me, valued me, loved me. But even more importantly, I, I realized that I had a God who had not given up on me because only he could have orchestrated all that. God was for me. I had the one thing. I had the one thing that couldn't be taken away from me. I had the one thing that would last forever. I had the one thing, and that one thing was enough. Years ago, a friend of mine made a simple statement that I have never forgotten. She said, you know what? I finally figured out that if I've got God, I've got everything. If I've got God, I've got everything. He is Enough. If you don't know Ash Hammock, you wish you did. I've asked her if she'd share with us for a moment. So, um, I... I grew up um, in, in the church, in a very small Baptist church, and uh, I was a idealistic optimist, and I was also observant, and that's a terrible combination, um, because I, I grew up wanting to see the beauty in the world, and as you get older and you, you see the way things are, you see the beauty, but you also see how corrupt it is and how broken it is. Um, and as I got older, and I, I, the same people that, that loved me and cared for me growing up 
I saw were also mean and abusive to each other. Um, the, the, what, like the people, the community that I cared so much for rarely lived up to its values. And the world that was just awe-inspiring with wonder and natural beauty was also filled with poverty and death. And after a while, that despair, the gap between what could be, what should be, and what simply isn't um, can break you a little bit. And I got to the point in my early 20s where I was, I became very aware that I was just one person and there was no way I was going to be able to change anything because I wasn't even a particularly good person. <laughs> um, you know, I was just as mean and bitter and broken as everybody else. And I decided to give in to despair and I attempted suicide. Um, and I don't know if I was just, uh, if I didn't know what I was doing or if there was a miracle that occurred. And I don't know if I ever will know. But it didn't work. And I woke up the next day and I was angry. Um, and I remember picking up my Bible and throwing it and just screaming at God and telling him, I, uh, why won't you just let me die? I want to die. And he, uh, as sweetly as he possibly could, told me, okay, but you're not committing suicide. And he led me to this verse um, that says, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has died and the new has come. And he led me on a journey the next several years to getting to know him. And what I got to know was a God that is just as heartbroken about the brokenness and despair and, and, and horribleness in the world and has paid the entire price to make it the way he designed it and to have the beauty restored. And he's invited me into helping him do that. And I'll get to spend my life restoring the world, like helping him to restore the world alongside my brothers and sisters who have accepted his offer as well. And then I'll get to rest and the next group after me will take it up. And one day all together we'll get to see it finished. And it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And I don't know how you can not accept that offer. Wow, thank you, Ash. He's everything, and he's enough. There was a man named Jack Hinton. Jack was a pastor in North Carolina, um, but he went on a mission trip to the island of Tobago. And on that trip, he was given the job of leading worship in a leper colony, working with people who's, <laughs> who had been just ravaged by leprosy, who had been quarantined for life. Their bodies had been partially destroyed, and they were considered complete untouchables, complete outcasts. So Jack was leading a worship service with those people one evening, and it was kind of informal setting. He said, hey, we got time for one more song. Does anybody have a request, something that you'd like for us to sing? And when he asked that question, a lady who had been kind of facing away from the stage, she turned to look at him. And honestly, Jack was, he was shocked by what he saw. The lady barely had any lips left. Her ears and her nose were completely gone. And when she turned to look at him, she lifted a fingerless nub of a hand up in the air and she said, oh, can we sing Count Your Many Blessings? What blessings did she have to count? What did she have to be thankful for? Everything. Everything. Because see, she knew. She knew she had the one thing that couldn't be taken away from her. She knew that she had the one thing that wouldn't go away, the one thing that really mattered. She had the one thing, and that one thing was enough. 
she still had a voice. And so she lifted that voice in worship, singing, Count Your Many Blessings. At the end of that chapter, that contains the painting of the two mountains, this is what the writer said. It's the verse we started with. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, meaning it's permanent, it can't be taken away from us, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. We have a Father who has rescued us from Mount Nightmare and given us a home with Him on Mount dream come true. And what's he asking in return? Our worship, our hearts. You know, we can come to church sometimes like we have bought some high-priced tickets. Like we're at an NFL football game and we're looking for some fine entertainment. And we talk about whether or not we enjoyed the service. And if we didn't, we, we say, you know, I just didn't get anything out of it. Maybe the question is, what did you put into it? Because see, that's what the, the Father is asking of us as a response, just to give Him our heart. You know, I think this is a, um, I think this is a word for somebody here that is a personal word from God. If you will give me your heart, I will take care of all the rest. If you'll give me your heart, I'll take care of all the rest. That's what worship is. And that's what a worship service is all about. So as residents of Mount Dream Come True, we're going to spend the next few minutes responding to his goodness in worship. Just giving him our hearts. And I want to ask you, if it's possible for you, don't leave. You're not going to be shamed if you do, but, you know, this is not the fourth quarter. This is what we're here for. And if you just engage with the Lord in worship, in whatever way that, whatever that looks like for you, whether that's being quiet and still, whether that's jumping up and down, whether it's yelling and dancing, whatever it looks like for you, if you will just genuinely, authentically engage with him in worship and give him your heart, see if he won't meet you here. Worship team and ministry team, will you come up? As we enter into a time of worship, it could be, though, that you realize you don't have the one thing because you've never said yes to what Jesus did for you. You've never given him your heart. You can be rescued from your Mount Nightmare, and you can find the one thing that really matters, the one thing that will give your life meaning. If that is you, please just walk up here and let one of these people pray with you and help you find that one thing. If you, if you don't want to walk up here, raise your hand where you are and somebody will come to you. If you need prayer for a health issue, a relationship issue, financial issues, whatever you need prayer for, that's what our ministry team is here for. So as that is happening, we enter in to our response to him. So he has given us a home on Mount Dream Come True. We lift our, 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 our voices in worship and give him our hearts. Will you stand? Come Holy Spirit. Lord, you are everything. You're everything and you're worth everything. And so today, we give you our hearts. We give you our hearts. But Lord, we can't even do that on our own. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you come. That you come and you engage us. That you capture our hearts and help us to give everything we have to you. You know, I sense that there are people here who you would love to experience God's presence. But you don't even know how. So Holy Spirit, we need you. We need you just to come and permeate our minds. Permeate our hearts. Permeate this entire room. And Lord, I pray that every person here will experience your presence today. That when we live, when we leave today, we'll know that we've been with you. You are everything and you're enough.
Come up and tell us about your painting before we quit here. Just hold the music, keep it going for a minute. Um, so Carla asked me to, to paint an accompaniment to her sermon, and she told me that she was going to be preaching about the two mountains that represented the two covenants. And uh, what that brought to mind for me was how the, the first covenant, the old covenant, was good. It was given by the Lord but it was ultimately just a pale reflection of what was to come. And uh, 
just the beauty of, of what Jesus did and what he is to us. I plan to take a picture of that before I leave and put it on as a screensaver to remind me that I live on Mount Dream Country. Yeah. That, is, uh, that is so good, so good. A pale reflection of the reality that is Jesus. And so we bless you. Uh, and it's been a good morning. It's a good morning with you. And uh, what, a, what an incredible word. You know, there's, I'm going to do this. Just I'm going to take this last couple of minutes. There's an exercise I used to do on Thanksgiving. I'm just going to go ahead and do this. You may have done it with me before. I want us to just, just in the quiet for a minute. Just hold the music just a moment. And in the quiet, I want you to take 30 seconds. Close your eyes right where you are. And I want you to think of something God has done in your life where he poured out his Un, just that unmerited favor. He, he, he blessed you or he did something in your life that you know you didn't earn it or deserve it, but it's his goodness. Stop and just meditate on that for 30 seconds. Just as you're just thinking on that and feeling that, can you feel it in the air? Can you feel that spirit right there around you in the air? That spirit of gratefulness? That spirit of thankfulness? And what accompanies that is a spirit of humility. There is humility tangible in the room as you begin to recognize the goodness of God. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, that you are worthy of all of our thanks, all of our praise. And we go out this week, Lord, in a humble revelation of who you are and who we are as your children. Blessed beyond measure. And Lord, no matter what the circumstances around us, we know that you, you said already have overcome the world. And we walk in your goodness and your mercy. And we just acknowledge it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for being here. And uh, I think they're going to play a little bit, and I'm going to sit down and play with you a little bit. And then we're, we, you just enjoy and stay in worship as you, uh, as you leave. Bless you.